Father, we, we say, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Father, we confess our need for you today. Help us to focus and fix our eyes on you right now. We lay aside every worry, every disappointment, every offense. And Father, we ask that you would come right now and reveal yourself to us in the midst of our corporate worship. Father, we want to meet with you today. We glorify you and we make room in our hearts right now for you to come and do what only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. When my voice is gone, you are the one.
Heavenly Father, we just come before you today and ask you to bless this house. This is your house of worship, your house of prayer. Father, we just want to boldly say, there's no fear that's going to keep us from asking fervently and with faith and boldness to just say, come and just bring your power and just show us, Father. Give us vision and give us truth and deep understanding of that truth, Father. There are people here who are desperate to know you deeply, Father. And there are people who are just dry, dry, dry. Father, we're just asking for the well of life to just burst up and then just overflow, Father, so that we can drink up today, Father. Lord Jesus, we are just so grateful for, for what you're going to do here today. We are just excited for you. thought for us to continue thinking on what is it that God wants you can 
wants you to do that only he can do through you. And what he can do in your life that you're not letting him do, perhaps. So let's just reflect on the Lord as we sing this next song, Raise a Hallelujah. We're just going to praise his name, sing this awesome praise song. We're also going to reflect and just encounter the Lord on, on what it is that he wants to do for us. Father, we just want to ask you to collect with you, Father, what is it? Only you can do what you can do that you want to do through us, Father. We want to lay down our lives before you, Father. We know that we're before the throne. And we're just asking, Father, for your guidance and for the truth, Father, and just what only you can bring, Father. We are excited.
that we can read in the Word, and we can rely on them. Father, you encourage us to come together because of all the gain that we can have just by saying yes, just by coming together and just humbling ourselves and saying, we follow you, Father, and we choose to worship you. And worship isn't just a musical expression of praise, it's, it's what we choose to do every day. And every time we come together, it's the defeat of Satan. It's the defeat of sin. And Father, we know that your power is pure and is strong. And we desperately need that rest that we can get nowhere else. We desperately need that forgiveness we can get nowhere else. Father, and with that joy that we can live through every day, no matter how messy our lives are, Father. Father, as we continue, let us just reflect on this truth. We continue to ask you to do what only you can do, Father. We thank you. In your name, amen. You all may be seated. So part of our worship is our tithes and our offerings. So I want you to listen carefully as I read this two verses from Psalm 96, 8 and 9. It says, Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering. Come into his courts. O oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. In the, in the Old Testament, in Exodus 23, God lays out um, three feasts and celebrations that the Israelites were supposed to come to the temple to, to perform. And at one point, God says to the people uh, that they're not to appear before him without an offering, without a gift. So we're living in a new covenant. We're living in a new covenant with Jesus. So we're not under the law, but you can see from the old covenant God's heart for us and God's uh, example. And when, when, the, when the psalmist says, bring an offering, come into his courts, um, the understanding at that time was bringing an offering gave you access to worship God, actually. So, I, you know, we don't think of it that way anymore. And actually, the, the most holy offering we can give God is ourselves. But we're going to pass the baskets, and uh, that's about our money. So when, when we talk about our money, uh, it... Money represents a huge part of us. Money represents our time, our talent, and our strength. And money can also represent our inheritance. So sometimes our relation to how we approach money is sometimes reflected by how, how we feel about God. If we're stressed about it, uh, whether we trust God, whether we're generous, whether we're not, they're, the two are very connected. And it says, you know, you can't serve God and mammon. Mammon is actually not money. Mammon means the spirit that controls our attitudes in relationship to money. So, first of all, God wants our whole lives. That's the most holy thing we can bring. Next, we bring our offering, which is our tithes and our beyond our 10 percent is our offerings and so the lord wants our hearts to be generous and when we when we give to the lord we can come into his presence we can glorify him and we can experience him in a deeper way so it really is a heart issue it's nothing that we do out of legalism legalism and we're supposed to give joyfully so i'm gonna pray right now and ask the lord to speak to us about how we're to give and uh, one thing that the Lord is not interested in, I can guarantee you, is that He's not interested in our tips. You know, like you just throw a tip to someone, who, like give them a dollar, give them a couple crowns, you know, you leave a crown in the little tip jar at Starbucks or whatever. Okay, God is not interested in tips. He wants uh, our best, our first fruits, because He's worthy. And when we give to Him, we're giving to Him what is already... His and what He gave to us. So, by the way, we lift up um, our finances to You. We lift up our hearts to You. And Lord, any of us who need to be readjusted, any of us who are maybe under 
the spiritual influence of mammon, Lord, would you correct our hearts in that area? Would we put you first? Would we have the joy of coming before you in our worship, in, in our giving, in our offerings? I pray that you would speak to us right now how much we should give and what we should give and the quality that we should give. Lord, forgive us for the times when we didn't put you first in this area. Forgive us for the times when we just threw you some little tip instead of giving you our first fruits. But we, we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. Each time that we share, it's someone expressing uh, what communion means to them. Uh, certainly, uh, communion was uh, an ordinance of the church, and we were called to remember what Jesus has done. And I don't know, I probably have done 50 different messages about things that we can remember, like the why was Jesus' first miracle, he multiplied bread for 5,000, for 10,000, and maybe, maybe God wanted us to remember that he's a miracle working God, and we should leave here today knowing that our God can do miracles in our life. I've done that message before, but um, I thought of something else I wanted to talk about today. John, can I call you to read that slide really loudly? Hallelujah. Luke chapter number 22, verse 14 to 20 and 6. When it was time, he sat down, all the apostles with him, and said, You've no idea how much I have looked forward to eating this Passover meal with you before. I enter my time of suffering. It is the last word I will eat until we all eat it together in the kingdom of God. Taking the cup, he blessed it, then said, Take this cup and pass it among you. As for me, I will, I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God arrives. Taking bread, he blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Eat it in my memory. He did the same for the cup after supper, after supper saying, This cup is the new covenant which is my blood, blood poured out for you. Amen. Thank you. So, what do you think the disciples were looking forward to on this night? It wasn't just a Sabbath meal, this was a Seder meal, it was Passover. It was once a year they got to celebrate Passover. I'm sure they were looking forward to that. I'm sure Jesus was looking forward to that. But it occurred to me this week with my travels, I was in Dallas the last two weeks, uh, that Jesus was looking forward to something else. Anybody have any ideas? What else Jesus might be looking forward to? I'm sorry, go ahead. Being with his friends. Being with his friends. The kingdom. What do you mean by the kingdom? His second coming. Uh, specifically, uh, he'd already told the disciples several times, but they didn't quite get it. Uh, but Jesus knew uh, that night he would be arrested. That night he would be beaten. And that morning he would be on the cross. I don't think he was looking forward to the cross, but certainly he was looking forward to was what was after the cross. He was looking forward to going home. He was looking forward to a reunion with his Father in heaven. Right? He knew there's a price to pay to get there, but he so longed to be home. And Scripture is full 
of examples of the early church also looking forward to going home. Because we're citizens of heaven, not of this earth. Looking forward to being with their Lord and Savior. Looking forward to worshiping God for all eternity. And when I was in Dallas, a family member of mine uh, had two deaths in the family. And it was really interesting for me to watch how people handled it. And I've watched uh, my family, and I've watched Kelsey's family. So at the two, end of 2017, her father died, and then last fall, her brother-in-law died. And I sort of watched how her family reacted to it, and I watched how my family reacted to it. And in my family, I saw, like, outbursts and depression and uh, unforgiveness and bitterness and all this kind of stuff in her family I saw people just moving on and I, I wondered what was the difference and it occurred to me that uh, her family grew up in a Bible teaching church where people were taught the scriptures that we have something to look forward to that death has lost its sting that we have a glorious future ahead of us. And so do our loved ones who know Jesus Christ. In fact, if a loved one goes on to be with the Lord, that's something to rejoice about. Not something just to be depressed over. I have a sister who's depressed for three years now. We should be celebrating and rejoicing. We get to see those people again. They're not suffering anymore. They are with the Lord. Now, do you really believe that? Because that's what the Word says. God's Word is not ambiguous. It's not maybe. It's definitive. Jesus Christ has promised us eternal life. And all of our loved ones who know Him who trust Him as Savior and Lord, have been promised eternal life. We will see them again. And maybe celebrating communion, one of, the Jesus, one of the things that Jesus wanted us to remember is that we're all going home. There's a big reunion in heaven coming up, and we're all invited. And that's something to rejoice about. That's not something to hang your head and walk out of here, oh no, I'm going to die. It's, oh yes. I'm going home. And so today as we come to the table, I just want to come with a thankful heart and just to be able to rejoice that Jesus Christ has purchased our future. With His blood, we have been bought and paid for. We have been redeemed. And we are never going to die. We're going to live with Him for eternity. Let's pray. Father, today we want to remember the price that was paid to redeem us, to buy us back, to seal our future. We belong to You and we confess that today. And Lord, I pray that when death comes knocking in our families, uh, that we'll look up and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the future that we have in you. Thank you that death has lost its sting. Thank you, Lord, that our eternal reward that was given to us is you, to be in your presence forever. And for that, we give thanks today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to invite the servers to come forward. And we'll have wine over at these stations and over by the coffee uh, bar we'll have juice.
We've been teaching on uh, spiritual core values, community core values, and worldview core values. And today, it's going to be on we value generosity. And this is, uh, I've been with PCF off and on, uh, off when I was out of the country and on when I'm here since uh, 1996. And uh, one thing I can tell you is that this church definitely deserves a reputation for being generous. Uh, for example, you may not be aware, but we have something called Mercy Fund. And over the years, I have watched this fund be used when somebody was in a real crisis or emergency and the church has given sacrificially. They've even given when the, the offering was way below their budget and they still gave and helped. And that's the fund that you can contribute to if you're feeling like you want to give and you want to help the people who are the most in need. You can go to the leaders of this church. You can give money to that mercy fund that will be there when people are in a desperate situation. Um, I know there are even some people in this room right now who have benefited from that fund. When I hear a preacher say generosity, I usually think about money. And uh, I don't know about you, but my first thought is I kind of reach in my pocket and make sure that my cash is still there, my money's safe. Yeah, that doesn't happen here. I'm so thankful that, that I've heard many times in offering messages that the speaker says, um, if you can't give anything, if you can give some coins, whatever you give, just give it with joy and trust the Lord to provide for you. And I really, really am thankful for that. There were times when I was like some of the people that you see during the, when the offering plate's going around. I don't know if you've observed this. Now it seems humorous to me, but there was a time when it was me, and the offering plate would go by, and the person would reach in their pocket, and if they saw that they only had like a 1,000 crown note and a 500 or something, they'd go, well, I'll give next Sunday. I don't want to give that much. Or, okay, put that back in. All right, I got some coins. I can drop that in. And I'm just so thankful that God has done a revolutionary work in my life by the Holy Spirit to give me a whole different attitude about generosity. And I, I would like to share that with you today. I think that it's biblical. So, when the Bible talks about Generosity, it's not just talking about money, it's also talking about your time, about your talents, uh, about your ability to serve. One of the things that I'm so proud of, uh, here's Joseph sitting right here in the front row. And I will tell you, you can come here when the door gets unlocked in the morning on Sunday, every Sunday. And that guy will be lined up along with the team, usually including our pastor, to set up this room in this stage so that it's ready for the service. When they come in, there are no chairs here. They all have to come from the back room, be carried out, opened up, lined up for you. Nothing on the stage. Everything has to be set up. Generous serving parts. Something that really pleases the Lord. In the Bible, there are over 7,000 promises from God. There are more on gen being generous than on any other. So how important is generosity and giving in the Bible? Well, let's look at some important words. If you did a search for the presence of the word believe, okay, you would only see it. Imagine, believe. I mean, how important is the word believe? It's in the entire Bible only 272 times. That really surprised me. How about the word pray? Whoa. The backbone of the Christian life. So incredibly important. Only found 371 times in the entire Bible. Old Testament to New Testament. I was sure in this research that nothing could beat the word love. I mean, there's really next to God or Jesus or the Holy Spirit, there's nothing more important than love. So I figured, you know, that's going to be in there just thousands and thousands of times. 
It's in the Bible 714 times. What about give? What about this key element to generosity? How many times could give be in the Bible? 2,152 times. I would say that to God, giving is really, really important. Here's Cambridge's definition of generosity. A willingness to give help or support, especially more than is usual or expected. And synonymous words to being generous, altruistic, benevolent, big-hearted, bountiful, charitable, lavish, open-handed. I really like that one. Philanthropic. Two words that are really missing, among others, for Christians. What about faith and hope? To give generously, you have to have faith to believe that God will provide for you even if you gave to the point of sacrifice and not having enough for yourself. Have you ever given so much because God laid it on your heart that you didn't know where your next meal was coming from if you gave that money? That is a wonderful experience of walking in faith and generosity. And you have to hope that his promises are true. He gives a lot of promises that he's going to take care of us. Here's an example. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Now, some of you might have been reading this, and because I started with command those who are rich, you immediately said, okay, well, these verses don't apply to me. This is for the rich people. So I want you to raise your hand if you do not have enough money to eat one whole meal today. Oh, we have some. Keep your eye open, Pastor. Approximately 821 million people in the world do not have enough money to eat one full meal a day. One in every four children in the world has stunted growth due to malnutrition. How many of you do not have, in the place where you're staying now, running water, electricity, or a toilet? Anybody? Well, 1.6 billion people in the world don't have those three things. Now, the question is, Does this include you? Compared to so many in the world, are you actually rich? I think we really are. We don't imagine that we have enough to be generous, and in reality, there are people in the world, over a billion of them, who dream of living like you live right now. So, I think we have the opportunity to be generous. Having a spirit of generosity requires obedience. Why obedience? Well, in the Bible, there's lots of promises from God if you're generous. It's, if you do this, God says, then I will do that. And that's common. For example, Proverbs 11.25 says, A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Or, Proverbs 22.9, the generous will themselves be blessed, for they share their food with the poor. God promises, if you're generous, I have a lot to give you in return. Now, I know some of you may be uncomfortable with that analogy because I'm saying, God always says, if you do this, then I'll do that. And some of you are thinking, wait a minute, salvation doesn't work that way. I'm saved even if I do nothing. Is that really true? Wait a minute. Doesn't the Bible say you have to believe? And believe that you're a sinner? 
and believe that Jesus Christ is the only Son of God and died on the cross for you and repent and let Him be Lord? That's a lot that you have to do. Well, of course, I don't want you to be generous because of what you're going to get out of it. But I'll give you a short list of what the Bible says a generous life will give you. Others will see your generosity and praise God. These are all just taken from endless scriptures on generosity. It frees you from materialism. It tells others you love them. It blesses the body of Christ through your tithes and offerings. It enables missionaries to go out to reach the lost around the world. And when I finish speaking, you're going to hear from one such missionary that this church helped send out. It gives food and clothing to the poor. It humbles you and fills your heart with joy. God will bless you in your job or your business. It tells God that He can trust you. God will bless you in your work and all you do. Wow. If you're generous, you'll be humble when you're generous. You'll, be, you'll have love and express love when you're generous. You ever had anybody give you something to help you and they did it without love? That is not generosity. That's just charity. God wants you to give in a loving way. The synonymous word to, to generous that Cambridge left out is loving. Can you think of anybody more loving than your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Can you think of anybody who was more generous in giving everything he had than Jesus Christ? Including his life. And he's our role model. He's who we're supposed to be like. I've always struggled with the fact that our role model uh, was tortured, ridiculed, and died on the cross, and that I'm supposed to be like him. I don't really know you. I don't know about you. Um, Everywhere Christ went in his earthly ministry, he gave. To the end, even on the cross, he gave. His primary motivation, what was it? For God so loved the world. His motivation for generosity and love. When I have to do something difficult, I need inner motivation. I need something deep and empowering to be motivated to do something hard. It's not enough to do it because I know it's the right thing to do, or I should do it, or if I don't do it, there's going to be negative consequences. And I'll tell you one of my proudest moments as a dad. Three days ago, I told my oldest boy, Kiki, he's seven, that we would go for a walk. And we went for a walk, and we went by this playground that had uh, these bars that the kids can just hang on in the air by their, by their hands. And Kiki loves to do this. And he started, when I first started walking with him this way, he started at 20, and then it was 30, and then it was 50. And this time, when he was hanging, he hung to the count of 70. I count, and he holds on with for dear life, because he wants to have that record. You will never meet a more competitive boy than he, i got to tell you. So, that was three days ago. Two days ago, I told our middle-aged boy, he's six, his name is Sammy, Samuel or Sandra. I told him, we're going for a walk. We got to the park and said, I'm going to hang. I didn't tell him how many, how many seconds Kiki had hung there. He just jumped up there, he held on, and he held on for a hundred seconds. He blew his brother's record away. I didn't tell him what his brother's record was. But I knew that the moment I got home, Sami would go find Kiki and tell Kiki, I held on to the count of a hundred. Now, the normal response that Kiki would give would, would not be in any way what you would call generous. He would be angry, he would be frustrated, and he would say, uh, let's go to the playground right now, I'm going to beat that record. Alright? But instead, Kiki turned to his brother and he said something I knew. Never meant to be He said, Sami, that's great. You did much more than me. You're the new number one. 
He was generous in praise, and his motivation came up because he loved his brother. And inside I thought, he's going to be a fine man. Wow. If you've been wondering if you're going to have kids, you don't have them yet. If you can think maybe or no. But this doesn't require me to be too unselfish. It'll use so much of my time. Please have kids and just love them. It'll transform your life. Um, so crucial to being generous is that it comes from the heart. And the best is when your heart is full of love that comes from the Lord. Love is not about giving, it's about giving. And godly generosity is giving with no expectation of return. Now originally I planned on telling you a lot of wonderful stories to demonstrate generosity. I could go on the internet and of course I could find amazing stories of people who sacrificed incredible amounts. But then uh, God decided that he would teach me a tough lesson and it would come from my own life. Well, my family just came back from a one month vacation in America. And uh, we were on the same family on the west coast, most of the time by the water. If you've never been on a one month vacation, I highly recommend it. You just feel like, now this is a real vacation, I'm in no rush, I can just enjoy it. Second time we've done that. So, while we were in America, we saw someone in my family that really, uh, he's quite old, two years older than me, that's quite old. He has no real retirement, he was destitute, and um, while we were there, he was kicked out of his home because he couldn't pay the rent and had to move into the back of his truck. A family member. Well, Ann and I, of course, we wanted to help him, but we live in Europe, and this kind of person needs long-term care. So we prayed, oh God, please help him. And we got on the plane and came back. As soon as we returned to the Czech Republic, I got some real mail. Not email, real mail. And here it was, from the Social Security Administration of the United States. Why did I get this? Because in August, I turned 65. And the United States government was telling me, if you just reply to us and say you're ready, we'll start sending you a check, your Social Security retirement income, for the rest of your life. Well, I thought, you know, it's because something happened in my company recently where my retirement income that I'll get from them went down. And I thought, well, this makes up for it. On top of that, we could save this, maybe, if we can get by, and every year we'll have enough money to keep going on those wonderful vacations. Perfect timing. God had other plans for the money. See, I was God's answer to our prayer for this family member who needed help. Well, I immediately had a lot of selfish thoughts. I thought, uh, what if he wasted? He's never handled them wisely, otherwise he wouldn't be, be in this situation. This is not a good idea. Without me even mentioning my idea to my wife, God showed Anna, my wife, a wonderful way that we could give this money and help him in a totally responsible way. He would be homeless no more. I only had to give it for the rest of his life. Let's just say I had mixed emotions, okay? Because I am at heart a very selfish person. You can ask my wife after the service. She'll give you countless examples. Um, so God had a discussion with me and went something like this. God asked, do you trust me to provide for your family? I can replace that Social Security money tenfold. <laughs> Sorry, that's the way our dogs sound when we leave without taking them for a walk. And then I just thought, well, that's about the way I feel, you know. Um, and he says, can't you be joyful? 
Who is your Lord? He asked me. And I had to say, you are. What does my word say? He asked me. I know, I know. If any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. But, Lord, he said, I want you to enjoy this. My word says, and this is in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And all I could say was, yes, Lord. I had to let go of my money and remember who owns it. Who owns me? I was bought with the price, an incredible price on the cross. And his timing made it pretty clear this was exactly the answer to prayer. You know, he who paid for you is faith untrue. We can give and give and give because our source never runs dry. To give generously with your time or your actions, your talents, your things, it requires believing that God will give you what you need in your time of need. You can be generous with joy, not fearfulness. You would not exist if God didn't give. From the creation of this earth to breathtaking birds in the air to uh, the amazing creatures on the earth, the waterfalls and mountains and valleys and the flowers and so many things that he's given, given, given us the mandate to rule over to the countless colorful creatures in the sea. He is a giving God. And we are called to be like him. That's who he's created you to be. Generous. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for uh, teaching me and humbling me in the area of giving. Uh, it's been a wonderful lesson, and I pray for everyone in this church that they will give in, in a ridiculous way, a way that the world cannot comprehend, because you are faithful. You will not fail them. You are there. You're not silent. You're in their life. You are beside them, in front of them, behind, in them, protecting them, caring for them. If they can trust in you, Lord, you can turn this world upside down. Like, like people like on and my dear friend, Elizabeth Barsh who went to a difficult and actually, for a person like her, dangerous ministry to bring the good news of Jesus Christ, the generous gift of her life. So we praise you for her example. Help us, help us to be more like Jesus Christ. Let us be a generous people. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Harsh. Um, in January, I moved to Spain, and there I am working with an organization called Youth with the Mission. Um, and we run schools there where you learn more about God, and then you have a practicum in a different country to um, kind of practically work out what it looks like from what you learn. So it's three months of biblical studies and then we go into um, yeah, North Africa, which all the countries in North Africa. Um, so these are the five students that were part of our school this year. And I led them into North Africa where we did our two month um, practicum of BTS. Uh, while we were there, then, we got to be a part of a lot of different things. So, some of our, like, earlier on, we did um, trekking in the mountains. 
So there are like very remote villages, um, and we just got to come, and it was some for a lot of people. It was the first time they'd seen foreigners come into these villages, and the villages only have about 100 people in them. Um, and so bringing bringing the light that we have and just living. You know, there's not, we can't um, speak their language very well. We can only say like, hi, how are you? My name is. Um, but through that, really trusting in God and seeing like the barriers that he like crossed in that and, and showing love and having them like come up to us and be like, can you pray for me? Like, I know that God he is full of prayers. Like, that's crazy. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then going into cities, and, and there are um, students there that some have kind of fallen up away from Islam and, and are seeking truth but don't know what that is, and others are like very, very devout, and, and in seeking God and seeing their hearts to find truth, like both those groups, their hearts to find truth is so powerful because they'll come up to us and they'll ask, like, who is God? Who is God to you? Who, like, who is Jesus? What is grace? And it opens the door for us to explain, like, what we believe in the freedom that we walk in, because it, it's so contrary to their mindset of, like, this is what I have to do. If I don't do this, then it's done, you know. And we can walk in freedom, and uh, you know, as we walk the streets, as we're finding like creative ways to engage the culture. Um, yeah, seeing like some of the scales fall off, seeing like being able to speak out truth in, in a place where there isn't truth is incredible. And then being able to do it like with a team of students and seeing how they grow in their giftings that God has given them. And, yeah, <laughs> being able to be. Yeah, a small part of, of what God has for, for that region. Um, yeah, and to, like, definitely, like, every place that we went to, there's something new, there's something exciting that's happening. There's a fresh wind that's blowing through with, with all these questions. And, yeah, like, a lot of times we didn't get to see a lot of um, what was happening, especially locally, because it's very, very underground, but, um, like, being able to step in. So the picture before <laughs> um, is kind of a symbol of their hospitality, so, like, sometimes we would just get invited by, like, someone off the street and go into their home, and they would give us, like, tea, they would give us coffee, they would give us smoothies, they would bring their like biggest dish and fill it with food. Um, and just their hearts, they have such amazing hearts and hospitable hearts. And yeah, just just seeing how God is already in their culture and using them and, and bringing that truth to some, then see transformation in that. Um, yeah, and then the next picture is this is just like in the mountains where we were trekking. Um, and so there's a little village on the top there, and there are villages scattered all around this mountain range. Um, yeah, and seeing like the simplicity that they live in, and, and yeah, asking God to bring His truth in, into what that looks like. Um, yeah, and there are brothers and sisters all across that region. And yeah, it's really, really important to be praying for them because it's dangerous and they don't get a lot of encouragement because they're usually very isolated and don't know others because of um, like the mistrust and the fear that is within um, my communities. So yeah, being able to come and encourage like isolated Christians who meet mm -hmm. that is also really incredible. Okay, um, so prayer requests definitely like the three kind of groups of people. Um, yeah, just Muslims have open hearts to what we're doing there. 
Um, also for next year, we're running another school in September. So for students to come in, in and join and um, really that God would open their hearts to what he has for them and what's, what's in his will for their lives. Um, and then, um, yeah, so like prayer support and financial support for me as I'm going back there in two weeks and starting to prep um, prep for the next school and also hopefully doing some regional trips to build relationship and bring encouragement. So, yeah. Okay. Well, can we all stand? You can just pray right where you're at. Just pray out loud. You can even pray in your native language if you want. And we'll pray for those requests as well as pray for others with Father, thank you for all you're doing. And we want to send Elizabeth back out to do your work. Thank you for her heart. Thank you for her heart of, that's willing to walk by faith. We bless her to be bold and to be obedient and to walk through um, doors that most of us can't walk through or, or wouldn't be willing to walk through. So, Father, we bless her to go forth into what you're calling her to do. Pr protect her, Lord. Pour out your blessing on her. In Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, you can be seated again real quick. I want her to stay up here with me. So as a practical application for what sermon we just heard about generosity, we want to take up an offering for Elizabeth. And uh, so you can pass. The, I know that we didn't have uh, time to prepare you for this. But just as you feel led, uh, we want to sow into her ministry, into her life. And we are so blessed that you can come to share with us. Is there anything else you want to say? Yeah, I would ask you not to share or post about um, what was just said because a lot of the uh, information is sensitive. So just yeah, use discretion. Uh, thank you. So John's going to come and bless us, and we are so honored that we can bless your ministry. I'd like to invite you to stand for the benediction. If you are interested to come to the New Connections lunch, I'm going to be over at the coffee station and we're going to head right up to the Sunday school room as quick as we can. I just want to bless each of you today with the Father's love. I want to bless you with Jesus' grace. Lord, bless you with the Holy Spirit's fellowship. That was Paul's prayer for the church. And it's my prayer today for you. Leave here today with the joy of your salvation. And may your life count as you give it away to those that God brings into your path. In Jesus' name, amen.